You're listening to pre Cana with the Pope, a podcast aimed at restoring confidence in marriage and family life. Hey there, everyone. This is Monica, and welcome to episode 44 of pre Cana with the Pope. In today's episode, Renzo and I sit down to talk about one thing and ended up talking about another. Together, we discuss what we've been reading, the balance of redemptive suffering and expectant faith, and how hard it is to pray for a miracle. We're so happy you're here with us. Let's jump in. So what are you reading? Tell us. We all want to know. What books am I reading? Like, yes. in my leisure? No, tell me all your text messages. <laughs> go through them one by one <laughs> like i'm not reading anything right now um i'm reading he leadeth me mm. we're finishing that up soon probably before christmas is that written in old english no okay good question just i just interesting that's that a that good point interesting it's title yeah um i wonder i don't know I don't he had know. a lisp sorry sorry <laughs> i did read the book i'm sure he doesn't have a lisp <sighs> well I, you won't know if you just read a book. You can't tell if somebody has a list. <laughs> You're right. It's not it's like not a te- it's, not, it's not like a text to talk or talk to text. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, and I mean, every week I read Food for the Soul. Tell us more. That's not like chicken soup. <laughs> I remember those. Those are good. Yeah. I enjoyed those. Um, yeah, so that is, uh, it's written by Peter Kreeft and it's, um, like a compilation of all the readings for the year and then his reflections on each read, well, his Sunday readings for the year. So I read it every Sunday. Um, and he writes a reflection after every reading. So it's kind of like little homilies for every, mm. each of the readings for Sunday. That's for us, us Novus Ordo people who are on the ABC cycles of the reading. That's true. Yes. Yeah, no, I, uh, I think that's just, I that's awesome. That. I love that he does it. And, um, yeah, I when we first, when you first started when you first got the first edition, which is like was last year's, so yeah. we bought the books together. Yes, I quickly fell off because I have no discipline, and then I stuck with it stuck almost with it. every week. Um, yeah, I really like that. And then what else am I reading? Um, I'm reading a Saint Maximilian Kolbe book. Are you? Yeah. When? Uh, Hiding from me? No, I'm kidding. I'm like not. when I'm. I mean, the other book, He Leadeth Me, is for my book club. So that's usually when I sit down to read, I read that so I don't fall behind. Um, that's cool. What's Which one's that? The, no, not the, the Maximilian Colby book? Um, I mean, you don't have to show me. Like, I just didn't know if you remembered it. I like, I rearranged books, so I don't know. <laughs> I got, I sat, <laughs> I sat at the, we were, we were decorating for Christmas and I ended up sitting in a chair next to the bookshelves. And I was, I don't know what got into me. I was like, I'm just going to rearrange this. Rearranged so I, I rearranged my all piles. the books. I do know what got into me. ADHD got into yes. me. And I was like, this looks out of order. Let me put it in an order that's still out of order, but it makes, makes sense, sense to me. Uh, um, I'm reading Forget Not Love. Oh, where did I put it? On the top shelf. Oh, I did? To the right. Okay. Because I was thinking, I was like, I'm going to get the books that you could just like pick and meditate on and put them on the very, very top. And then, not there. <laughs> I don't know where I put it. The, the top shelf, not on oh, top oh, oh. of the bookshelf. Was it a little worn? No. All right, I don't know what I'm doing. It looks almost new. Okay. Well, then, oh, those are the ones that I didn't care for because no, I didn't. No, I, you, it's tucked away. It's all right. <laughs> I see it. So Good. when I sit in the reading chair, That's, I can still see That it. is the reading chair. I just think it's. I. I what are you reading? I'm reading text messages. Um, so I. One of the issues I have is that I can't read more than one book at a time, which unfortunately means I never finish books. Mm -hmm. Like I'll read like three quarters of the way through. But right now I'm trying to be good about it. I'm reading the book, um, What is Redemption? Uh, Gomer, in another episode, I forgot what he was talking about, in what show he was talking about it. Oh, no, it was in in Every Knee Shall Bow. He talked about that he was reading this book. So I was like, oh, I want to read that because it's about redemption. And I love anything about redemption the redemption because i really think it's something that that the that most catholics don't even fully understand because like there's so much and it's so much nuance to it um so this book is, it's called what is redemption it's about uh why jesus died on the cross for us 
which sounds super basic and super easy, but like the, when you start unpacking that, um, you, you, you realize that there's a lot of, um, incorrect thoughts that we might have about what, why Jesus died. So like, um, like we know that he died for our sins, but for some people, they think that like, that means that, um, God punished Jesus instead of us so that we can go to heaven. Right. Or that, that, um, Jesus, um, like in just in like in that thought, like they got either God punished Jesus or that Jesus felt, um, the full weight of sin because that's what we actually should have felt. So therefore now we don't have to do that anymore. So now we can go to heaven. Um, and both those thoughts are actually, uh, not right and not correct. Um, and that there's like, there's more to what it meant for Jesus to die on the cross and for us to be redeemed. Um, and then, then like what the part that I really like, and it's also part of theology of the body. And it's part of the, a, a lot of the different things I've read, um, this particularly through my th- theology courses was that like, there are saints who've said that we can experience like hints of the redemption here. Um, so like the effect here like on here on earth, sorry. So like we have a, this effect of sin in our lives. Um, and we, we will always have that, like the concupiscence, but like we could also fe- have a, um, a glimpse of what it means to be fully redeemed here on earth. So like part of what we will experience in heaven, we can experience here. So that's, that's what I'm reading. And uh, it's all like St. Thomas Aquinas is quoted everywhere. Like it's really cool. Cause the, the author didn't just quote the Summa, but also quotes like his homilies. I don't know if they're homilies, but like his commentary on the different books of the Bible. So like there he's commentaries on John, Mark, Matthew, like, so I'm just, I'm getting to read more of what he says. Mm. So it's just, and, and like you love different Thomas. epistles. So like, it's just, it's just, yes. I enjoy it. And I underline in fold pages and I just, I just ruin books that way. So can you give one example of how we can live in the redemption now? Oh my goodness. One, one example of how to do that now. Um, so like one of the way, one example, how much time do I have? Um, cause I need to process this out loud, but like, so you opened a can of worms. Sorry. Well, it is, it is a can of worms. So like one of the things that I think is fascinating is the idea of, so like the idea of in the catechism, I believe it's paragraph like four thirty something. It talks about how when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, yeah, they ate the fruit um, from the tree of knowledge. It's not an apple. They don't say apple. It's fruit. Um, that uh, sin came into the world. Original sin came into the world, and at that moment, the the world was handed over to the power of the devil. So like the devil and evil were are now um, dominant in on earth because of original sin. So like now the, it's the world's under their dominion and, um, by Jesus life, death and resurrection and, um, ascension into heaven, like completing that full, that, that full, um, the full work that he did for us on, on our behalf. Um, we are now able to live no longer under that dominion. So like, we're not no longer under the dominion of sin, under the dominion of the devil. If we have faith and believe in Jesus Christ and, and accept his, him into our lives and, and, and by the sacraments and by our life of the church. Um, however, like we still see the effects of that in that we, as much as we, you and I want to be holy, like we still struggle. So like we are little thing, things like impatience or like, you know, we, we get angry with each other, angry with the kids, um, or even big things like people, like things like pornography and, 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 um, like drugs and, and just big things like whatever, adultery, whatever you can think of, like those big things too, um, still are part of Christian lives for some reason. Um, and one of the ways that it, that could be explained is that we don't fully live out the redemption that we, that has been given to us. That was one for us on the cross that like, there's, there is the, that yes, you have faith in Jesus, but then there's like a deepness to living out that redemption, living out that, that faith in Jesus, um, by allowing it to permeate all aspects of your life. And that happens through like, through growing in, in virtue, specifically in growing in virtue and by participating in the sacraments, because in every sacrament you're participating in some way in the redemption. So like the baptism, baptism is, is the beginnings of that. And, and, and then, um, and confirmation is also another aspect of, of, of baptism and Holy Spirit. And then the Eucharist should be the culmination of all of that. Right, like the Eucharist, in, and I think is in the Catechism, and I know it's also in Pope Benedict's um, Sacramentum Caritatis that like that the Eucharist is what all the other sacraments are, are leading you towards. Like that's the the final initiation is receiving Jesus in the Eucharist, which we believe is receiving His body, blood, soul, and divinity that He established on the, at the Last Supper, but also through um, His life, death, and resurrection. So like all of that, like you you grow, so if your question of like how can you experience the res- the, the redemption more is by um, being more aware of what you're receiving in the sacraments 
and and like being more aware of the areas of your life where you are lacking so that you could allow God's grace to make up for that lack in the in those areas. Not an easy thing like it's really hard for us to point out the things we have wrong with us and the things we need to work on. Like usually you are a great mirror for me of like, this is where I'm falling short. Like even in terms of my faith. Um, so like, um, so like we, we just came back from adoration we were at youth groups. So we just came back from adoration. We're recording this. And I, um, so like just praying over you and praying with you is something that I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with, which is the most bizarre thing. Like for me to be uncomfortable with that, because I, I know we've done that with, with youth group kids. We've done that in so many different environments and like co- conferences or whatever. Um, but it's still a thing that like, I find myself like a, I feel like a, a baby giraffe. <laughs> like I, I, I still feel like I'm, I'm like not sure how to do this, even though I've done this so many times. Like it's weird to be someone with experience in, in this area, but still feel like in my own life, this is difficult. <laughs> um, so like, I know this is an area where God is calling me to greater faith. And this is how I can, so by, I can't just like will myself to have more faith. I have to move when I feel like God's asking me to move in a certain way, but then also pray that he give me the grace because faith is a gift. Like he needs to give me this faith so that I can move on it. Like I can't just do this on my own. Um, and that's how you live out that redemption. Cause like a, a more redeemed Renzo who's living out his redemption is one that's able to move in the same faith as the apostles, Mm -hmm. which I, I know I don't have yet. Um, or at least I don't move like I do. So like, all right. So then obviously I'm, I'm either, I I don't have enough faith to move on faith or like I, you know, there's something that I'm lacking. And, um, I do think that like you in our relationship kind of points that out to me a lot of times, um, where I like, I could do more, um, or, you know, or as a father, like where, where I fall short and I need to be able to do more. Yeah. I just, I think that it's interesting that the, like the living out of your redemption kind of goes back to the basics though of like actually participating in the sacraments, even though that's a thing that, you know, like if you are a cradle Catholic, that's just what you grew up with is experiencing and preparing for sacraments and then being part of the sacraments. But like that, that really is, that's I mean, when we're teaching John Paul is getting ready for his first communion. So he's really learning about sacraments right now. And, um, you know, what, what are the sacraments do? They give us grace what is grace, God's life in your soul. And, you know, and so, and what happens when, when you sin, well, you lose God's grace in your soul, you lose God's life in your soul. Um, but like that really is, that's, that's what Jesus came to do is to, you know, implement, to start the sacraments so that his work could continue on in the church. And like, that's why the church is such a gift directly from him because without the sacraments, we can remember what he did before, but we don't have a thing to like go to and activate and participate in. So I just think that's neat that like, I don't know for me as like, I try not to take the the sacraments for granted now that I've, you know, like just experienced, I, I mean, experience the Holy spirit and experience grace move when, when I've like paid attention to what's happening and, and, tried to engage in it, but I think it's a really good reminder that, yeah, that like at every mass and at adoration and like even our sacrament of marriage, that like this is a place of redemption and not in the like, um, not in like the hypothetical or theoretical, but like actual redemption can happen. I don't know. How would you define redemption? I don't, I struggle with like coming up with my own definitions of things. Um, Is there one that you underlined or circled? I probably did. Page marked in your book. But like, so like, um, I guess I could like, I can think my way through it. Just like, I guess process it. But like, so the word redeem means to buy back. I think the, like the root word in Latin, I'm sure it means to buy back. I I remember that from something I did once. I believe you. Um, And so like, we could understand it if you like think of it like from theology body sense, like there's like the way Adam and Eve were before. So that there's, there's original man. Then there's after the fall, which is historical man. And then, um, after the redemption is, is, is redeemed man. And then there's eschatological man, which is like after, uh, like at the end, the end of time. So like, there's a way that we are going to be like when our bodies and souls are mm-hmm. reunited at the end of the world. Um, so like what St. John Paul II says in theology bodies that redeemed man isn't, a return to original man. So like, it's not like we are, um, 
once we re- experience our redemption, we're bought back, and now we are like Adam and Eve were. Mm. Um, like we're not, we don't go back to that. Like we are now a a completely new thing because now we have a a access to God the Father that Adam and Eve did not have because of Christ taking on our our, our nature and and mm. um, dying on the cross and and doing all those things for us. Like one of the ways that w- the book talks about is that like Christ, um, Christ's work. Uh, has made grace like a super abundant. Like there's, there's so much here for us now that we could be greater than, um, and more united with the Lord than, than Adam, Adam and Eve were. So like, so redeem would be that we are the way I understand the best is that we are fully free to love God as we ought and mm. to love neighbor as we ought. Mm. Um, and like the things that prevent us from living out our redemption are the things that prevent us from fully loving God and fully loving our neighbor. Um, so like that can be a whole plethora of things, right. like any little thing that we see. Like I, if you, if we have love as our, as like our, um, not guiding stick, but like if, if sorry, if, if love is our measuring stick, then I think you can kind of point out to like, all right, these are the ways that I fall short of that. Mm. And like, those are the ways that those are the areas that need to be redeemed so that I can love as I ought. Um, because that's, I think that's, that's the way God measures things is, is how much love can you give to it? Yeah. That's wild to think that, that we have that potential here on earth. I do think to your point that you started with that we often think that that's only possible in heaven. Mm-hmm. So we're kind of just getting through this part so right. that we can get to that part. Right. And then you have like Padre Pio and, and Mother Teresa and even St. John Paul who like, when you learn about their stories and their biographies, like you hear about these like little mystical things that they did and they had like such unity with God and like they were able to perform miracles and, and move in ways that like, Oh, that's, you know, Oh my goodness, they're saints, whatever. But like we were all meant, we we're all meant for that. And that, that's we're part. all invited to that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. We're, uh, yeah. No, I think we're all meant for it though. Like we're mm-hmm. supposed to, but I think there's what makes those, those lives of the saints like so like, Awe, like awe inspiring was because like they, they got to a place that we feel like we could never get to. Mm. Um, but the point is like, they didn't get there. It was God's grace that got them there and like their reliance on it. And like, we can do that too, but it's harder for Renzo than it is, than it was, <laughs> than it was, was for Carol Waitiwa. But what's nuts is like, but St. John Paul though went through so much suffering. And I think that's, that's another aspect of, of this that he talks about is that like, it's through suffering that you get there. Yeah. Um, because like, that's when those, like through suffering, those things really are shown to you. Yeah. They're really highlighted those places where you fall short. Right. Do you, I yeah. refer, we read the story with, with our kids. Um, I think his mom died first yep. and then his brother and then later on his, his dad, his dad. Mm-hmm. So like for him to lose his family by like, I think 15, 16, like He's young. Yeah. Just like, and then, and then the Nazi, Nazi, yeah. Nazi occupation or was it communist occupation? I'm terrible at history now, but like, even like yeah. that, like there's just his, life and upbringing was not like a, oh, he had two great parents who, and, and all eight kids and they went to mass every Sunday. Like they, he didn't have that. Right. And, and through that, he was able to be what he was. Right. I mean, that being said though, he did still, like he had those, those small things to grasp onto though. His parents were like very devoted parents to mm-hmm. the, the two boys. And then like, he and his dad prayed liturgy of the hours together, you know, as he was like a young kid and stuff like that. So like, he definitely had a very good example, uh, like a very good foundation to like face suffering Mm -hmm. with because of his upbringing um, and things like that. But, but yeah, it's just remarkable what he obviously through grace, but like what he was able to, like absorb from suffering and then transform it too, because it's not like he, it's not like grace escaped him from suffering. Like, Mm -hmm. like who I'm just going to pull John Paul out of the suffering and move him over to this place of perfection. But like it was, it was like in the midst of suffering that his greatness was developed and fostered and came out through, through the supernatural grace. Yeah, he um and he writes in his encyclical on suffering, Salvific Dolores Dolores. Um, he talks about how like that Christ Christ coming and dying, so like the whole aspect of redemption, wasn't he didn't do it so that to to relieve our suffering, but to give our suffering meaning. Mm-hmm. Um, which I think is such a powerful thing because I don't know if we talked about it here, but the problem of evil and the problem of suffering is probably the one of the greatest reasons why people don't believe in God. Right. And that, 
And why that, do good why do bad things happen to good people? Right. right. That big question. Right. And instead of like coming in and taking it away, um, instead he comes in and, and gives it meaning. Mm-hmm. Um, so like in in first Colossians and no, not first Colossians, Colossians chapter one verse twenty four, uh Saint Paul writes that that he makes up for what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ by his own suffering. Um, and St. John Paul talks about how like that doesn't mean that there was anything missing in the cross. Like Jesus didn't wasn't missing anything by dying on the cross, but instead that like Jesus gives us the opportunity to now unite our sufferings to him so that we can participate in the resurrection the same way he did. Mm. So like it's our suffering means something now. And it, it in the same way that his suffering saved humanity, like our suffering can do can add to that and we now we participate in our own salvation and salvation of others. And like it's just it's a very it's like a different answer when you ask God like A or B, like mm-hmm. he, he says C. Yeah. Um, and I think that's like an example of that. I don't know. It's just, I, I like, I don't even know if this is what our audience wants to talk about. I could talk about this stuff forever. Cause I, I just, it, it is the stuff that I think I struggle with the most to implement in my life. So like, I just enjoy like thinking through of like, how do I do this? Struggling with what? Like with, handling suffering yeah just handling any of it like handling trying to be holier handling um because like you could talk about how like it's easy for me to think about this on a theoretical level like i it is it's like i am i am great at math but i need a calculator does that make sense because like in the moment i need to i I can't my head stops working like i need to like do you know what i mean like i so i feel like what i can i can know all this and talk about all this but like as soon as i have to live it like that's when you have to put it into practice nope i need my calculator like Mm -hmm. does my phone not have an answer like that's it's it's just a lot harder to to live out so like and i think Mm -hmm. that's that's i think it's so hard for me because i get like lost in the moment i don't even know if it's like that i am doubtful or that I, yeah, like, or, or that like, I don't trust or have faith, but it's just like, I forget in that moment to like Mm -hmm. turn in that direction. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm just trying to handle what the suffering that's in front of me. Right. You know? And then it's like, you, you're able to take a step back and breathe for a second. You're like, shoot, I had all those things that I wanted to do better. (laughs) Did you, did you get to hear what I said to the teens during adoration? Um, yeah, about praise. Yeah. But did you hear what I started with? I don't I just don't want to repeat it in case you did. Well, so like I talked about how like in the Old Testament God tells Israel to like remember oh, yeah. when I remember when I did this in XYZ. Mm-hmm. And like I think that 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 came up to me that came in yeah, came to me while I was praying and I was like, Oh, I should maybe say this. I usually don't like talking during adoration, but like whatever. I'm trying to move in faith when I feel like God's telling me to do some something. Mm-hmm. Um but I feel like that was such a big and I'm starting to pray the liturgy of the hours now because I found a a new podcast slash YouTube channel that um, the guy who the, I think it's two guys who run it they they sing the liturgy of the hours for morning prayer and for evening prayer so I've been putting it on for morning prayer and I've really enjoyed praying with the Psalms and and hearing God say like in in reading through when God did things for Israel and and they're they're praising him for it because um, they especially are people who who he did things for and then they forgot and they got to do it again. And and like, mm-hmm. and they still didn't listen. They weren't faithful for these things. And I feel like that's, that's kind of my spiritual journey where it's like all of Exodus is right. actually current events. <laughs> right. Well, and, yeah. And just like all of it where I, as, as much as I, I can, I can t- t- name moments where I know God has done things and performed miracles and, and just done amazing acts in, in my life. But at the same time, like when things get a little hard, like I, I forget, mm-hmm. um, and like, there's a part of me that doesn't trust that like, he's actually going to do it this time. Or like the other, I made the other parts up in my head. Like those didn't really happen. Like there's all these thoughts that go through and I'm just like, I yeah. am terrible. I think the, the, like the, I may, I must've made it up or like, you know, it, it felt so good afterwards, like after the suffering was over, over that I like attributed too much to like God or, or I didn't really remember how hard the suffering was and stuff. I think the, yeah, I always get. I get wrapped up in overthinking Mm -hmm. and instead of just like just basking in the goodness of God Mm -hmm. or even just like I, in the, the thought, the the thing that helped me in the, in the last week was, um, was specifically praying in, 
in praise and like in, in power, knowing that God is going to show up. Now I not knowing how he's going to show up, but knowing that, that he's going to show up. Um, that is an aspect of, of living out your redemption because we, we do believe we are bought back from the devil, that we are uh, new creations, that we are heirs to all the inheritance that Christ have because Christ is, is God, the father's son, and we are adopted sons and daughters. So therefore we are also heirs. And, um, one of the th- one of the lines that Saint John Chrysostom says in a homily on on a Ephes- he's like commenting on Ephesians six twelve, which is like that um, we don't wrestle with with powers of the world. We wrestle with p- principalities and, and powers of like a spiritual spiritual nature. Um, okay, and then and then he says, "For he that wrestles has not yet conquered," and that struck me with like the idea is like if those of us that are wrestling with 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 the devil and with temptations and wrestling to to an extent where we feel like we're losing. He's saying those who've wrestled have not yet conquered. And the reality is that Jesus has conquered this and he's, he wants us to live out as conquerors and as people who have, who, who are free. So the, the wrestling with the devil isn't one where like we are losing, but like the devil's trying to, to reach us, but he can't because of, of the power of Christ. And I feel like I'm not there. Cause I feel like any little thing comes up and I just like fall apart. Like as much as like, I feel like my house is built well, like a little, it's like the, the little pigs with the, with the wolf. Like I, I, is your house my, made of straw? my house is made of, my house is made of toothpicks. <laughs> like it, my house, I don't know what my house is made out of, but like anytime something comes up, I feel like it is a time to rebuild again mm-hmm. and not because I'm falling to sin and temptation, but like the, the, I think the sin that I, f- I am tempted with the most is despair mm-hmm. of just like, this is never going to get better. And it could be the dumbest thing. I just feel like this is going to be like this forever. It could also be my ADHD that gets me like that. Um, but like it's just a bad combo. <laughs> it's just a bad combo. I have so many feelings. I'm, ay, ay, ay. And it's going to be this way permanently. It's winter and I don't have enough vitamin D. Like all of it. It's just, <laughs> it's just out to get me. But like, that's, that's, that's how I feel the, um, like those are the movements that I feel. And, and then, then realizing like I, I am redeemed and I am an heir and I am a son and, and reminding myself of those things and then praying with that power has helped me mm. in in the last week of just like this is I don't know where this is going to go but but this is how I can trust. Yeah. Yeah, my tendency is control. Mm. Like I would say that's my like you said I, I don't know what sin temptation my way of coping. Like I just try to like grasp at the things that I can handle and I'm like all right, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to really hyper focus on this cuz it's something I can do instead of like, yeah, surrendering it over and like trusting that like God has already won this battle. Um, Cause you were talking to, you said before about like God is going to show up. And the thing that I'm trying to pray with a lot lately is like that God is already here. Mm. That it's not necessarily like the show up, you know, when, when the, when stuff gets the hardest, Oh, he's going to swoop in and show up. But like nobody's here right now. And like where, where is he in this and and how can I praise him here um, instead of the ahead of, you know, in the future? Do you think though, um, do you think that as Catholics we are, I don't know how to word this in a way that makes sense. So I'll just use too many words um, that like we are more willing to embrace suffering because like as like a, like as a, as a crutch to not have the expectant faith that like Protestants do. Cause I feel like that's more normal. Like it, it's, and I don't think it's an either or, but I do think like in the Catholic circles, like we're more willing to have like the redemptive suffering angle to life and to, to a life of faith. And then our, our Protestant brothers and sisters have more of like a expectant faith type um, and mostly cause they don't have the doctrine of redemptive suffering. So like, it makes sense that for them, like this suffering must come to an end somehow. So therefore it's, it's God's will that I pray for it to cease. So therefore I need to be moving in faith and grow in faith to be able to pray for these things to stop because it's not his will that I suffer because for them, there is no redemptive suffering. Whereas for Catholics, like a lot of us, and I don't know if it's true anymore. I know that like our parents may have been brought up with this, like offered up mentality, uh, because it, again, that comes from Colossians one twenty four that we offer it up in union with Christ's suffering. But I wonder if sometimes we do that because it is easier than it is to ask for faith and be possibly let down in the future. 
Well, I think, yeah, I've, I've definitely heard that phrase. I think sometimes overused, oh, I'll offer it up. But I, another one I hear a lot is, well, that's just my cross to bear. Mm. And it's just like, well, this is just the way it's always going to be. This is the thing that, you know, it's like the thorn in my side, but it's just going to be there and Mm -hmm. I have to bear with it. And, um, yeah. And I think that like, we can holy eyes it like Mm -hmm. (laughs) made up a word, but by saying that, you know, and then like knowing that redemptive suffering is a thing, you know, so I think that there, yeah, there can be that tendency to, to not try to either like grow through that suffering and just, I'll just sit with it or even the, like the bravery, the courage, the faith to like ask for something to change that's outside of your own control, because then what happens if it doesn't happen? Right. The way you ask for it. Right. So is it, does it, does our not asking come from self-protection because we don't want to be let down Mm. is one question. And then the other one is that like, um, because Jesus asked for his cross or for what was going to be his cross to be taken away, right? When he asks um, in the Garden of Gethsemane for for the Father to take this cup away, and then he says, "But but not my will, but your will be done," um, which is a beautiful prayer, and like that should be our prayer. But I think it's worth noting, and, and this is something I was reflecting on actually during adoration, was that that Jesus still did ask, mm-hmm. um, and I think I would say that the way that he asked was more um, was more faithful and expectant like expect expectantly faithful than what we could have because of the union that he has with God the Father. Like he knows what he's asking and he's not like asking with like a tentativeness, but like like in and expecting like I expect God the Father to take this away. But if he doesn't, I know it's because, you know, whatever. There's a reason for it. Yeah. So how do you balance that then? Like how do you balance that like expectation with also the surrender to God's will? Well, if, if you want me to externally process with a mic in front of me, I will. Because <laughs> I don't know if this is the right answer. Like, I don't, this is where I'm, this is where I enjoy theology with like, like, all right, what, are, what have saints said? What does the church say? And and how do we live that out in 2022 when there's things such as iPhones? Um, when like they didn't have that then. Um, I, I don't know what the right answer is because I'm still struggling with it. I do think though that there's, I do think that living out a redeemed life is kind of like the go between because like, again, we are heirs and I know like, I don't know, I forgot where in Romans he says this, but like, we're not just like, we're adopted sons and and we're also heirs of, of the inheritance. So like part of that comes with the power of like, we, God wants good things for us. Um, and so then we should not be afraid to ask for those good things. And sometimes that is healing for particular, like physical healing, spiritual healing, um, psychological healing. Like he does want, us to have these good things. So I think like in terms of the things that we would pray for, I think it's, I think the less a thing seems like a miracle, the more we're willing to ask for the thing. So like, say like you have a a broken relationship with a family member, like you don't necessarily need divine intervention for this to take place. So I think it's easier to ask God for those things versus like, like a repairing of the relationship. Yeah. Repairing, sorry. A repairing of the relationship versus like if, if you need, if you have a, like a medical issue and you need this healed, I feel like that's more of a risk of your faith to ask for that. Does that make sense? Hmm. Yeah. And I wonder too, if like, I wonder too, if asking for that reparation of like a, a relationship or like, um, like healing from sin or like a, addiction to sin or what have you is, also easier to ask for because there's other ways to explain why that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. If the miracle, like if that healing doesn't come from God, like, Oh, it was because of the, like the human dynamic of it versus, well, I have no control over this said health issue and only God does. And if he doesn't show up, then like what? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, Yeah. Sorry, you were saying even about like God healing people from sin because I know that I know from experience there's people who, and me being one of them, that like struggle with a particular sin, and feel like God could just take this away mm-hmm. if He wanted to, and I and I I genuinely pray that He's going to take it away, 
But like sometimes like the way he wants to take it away is different than right. we want it instantaneous, but like that takes no work on our part. Mm-hmm. But I think that's different. That's like in the moral life. Yeah. And I think that's very different from like the, like I just, I'm, I'm ill with this thing and I just I want it away. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, so I think, I do think that there's, there's a, a gravity for Catholics to go towards like the embracing the suffering. And I forgot what the question was that I was, I was answering. Oh, like, Oh, how do you, how do you, what's the in between? Mm-hmm. Well, like having expectant faith, but also, yeah, like being willing to suffer well and have redemptive, like to participate in redemptive suffering. Like what's the, what's the balance between asking for miracles and, Embracing the cross. <laughs> I, I would I would argue that we ask for miracles in every chance we get. Like that should be our baseline. Like we're always asking because that's that's a thing he wants from us. And then the things that go unanswered or, or see not they're not unanswered. They're answered in 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 a particular way. That's that's no. I'm not taking this away. I'm not healing this thing. Um, then we embrace that as a okay. This is a cross. This is a healing. Or th- sorry, this is a, this is a opportunity to to be united with Christ mm-hmm. more intimately. Um, or, but like, we could also consider like that, like, so you, you want a thing healed and God's not healing it instantaneously, but like maybe he needs, he wants, I don't know, more prayers to to happen or more, more things, or there's just other, like there, there's, there's a purpose of why he's, he's Mm -hmm. allowing it to happen and then trusting that too. Yeah. But I think that, I think the only thing that we need, we should like, at least, at least I need to do is still pray for the miracle. Cause like, I'm more willing to be like, well, if God, it's God's will, he'll take it away. But in the meantime, I'll just embrace my suffering and my cross. Right, right, right. That's my point. But I think too that like, I think you're, you just said about being in a more intimate relationship with, with Jesus is that if we are withholding a desire from him, then that's, mm-hmm. that's preventing us from being further intimate with him. So like even, like even just acknowledging that desire for wanting miraculous healing and like bringing that desire to him, like it levels up the intimacy between the two of you because you've then shared. I mean, he and again, we are we we can write this off and be like, oh, but Jesus knows what's on my heart, and I don't have to actually say it. But like for you to do the vulnerable thing and bring that to prayer, like bring that to active prayer instead of passive prayer of like keeping it in your heart, but like having that conversation with Jesus yourself. I think, um, yeah, it's like allowing you to enter more deeply into relationship with him. Yeah. And I think we're in a stage in Christianity, and this is from the book from Christendom to Apostolic Mission, that like when the early Christians were were preaching the gospel, like they they had, like the the gospel didn't make sense to to the world at that time. And I think we're in a sense in the same place where like, the way that we live our lives, our Catholic faith doesn't make sense to the world. And us just having arguments about our faith and, and trying to explain why, why our faith is right is kind of pointless. And one of the arguments the book ma- makes is that people need to experience the transcendent again. And one of the ways that God has been doing that, doing that for thousands of years is through miracles. Mm. Um, and people, even people of no faith, believe that miracles are possible. Like they may attribute it to, to something else, but they believe that miracles mm-hmm. are possible. And I, and that is like a thing of early Christians. Like if in, in our time now, if we're going to continue to grow the faith, like we need to be people who, yes, we suffer well and we, we embrace our suffering and we, we show our desires, but we also are people that like, we can pray for things and, and things do happen. And, and because God is good and God is working. Um, and I think balancing that out is, is part of what it means to be living out your redemption as, as re- redeemed man. Um, in the way that St. John Paul talks about it. not That's not an easy thing. Um, but like it is a thing I want to start trying to do more of and embracing more of. Yeah. I think too, in particular with our marriage, is like taking that a step further and kind of like I was saying with being vulnerable and bringing that prayer to Jesus is also like being willing to share that prayer that's in your heart with your spouse. Mm-hmm. And to like invite them into that prayer, like I am desiring a miracle here in this situation, in this whatever it is, but like to invite your spouse to into that and then also to invite your spouse to pray for that as well, I think is really um 
it's a really special opportunity, but it's, again, it's another way to like increase your intimacy and your vulnerability with one another is to like be willing to say that out loud and like talk about that and then pray for that together. Mm. I know you even said like tonight was uncomfortable for you to pray with me and over me. Baby giraffe. Baby giraffe. But like that was such a beautiful moment for us. And um, yeah, I I think too, kind of like going into the, you know, how, how Catholics kind of practice their faith is we're very private about it. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's a really big problem in marriages is that we're not like sharing our spiritual life with one another. Like, like letting in, like giving insights into like how we are growing in personal relationship with Jesus. But like also as a married couple, we should have a like joint prayer life. And, um, and how do we go about doing that? I think we have to be willing to be uncomfortable. Right. Well, cause the devil will thrive in the devil thrives in our lives when he gets isolate us. Yeah. And even like if you become a roommate with your spouse and even in the spiritual realm, like if you mm-hmm. become spiritual roommates where like that is just something you you don't talk about, you don't share or you share very like periphery, you know, service level. Like I'm not going to give you anything real. Um, I think he is then given the foothold to like, all right, I'm going to keep these guys separated. So then when they start going through things like I, you know, maybe they'll share like, Hey, I have this one issue that I think I, that God's given me or whatever. Um, but never really like share the, like you said, like the desires of your heart. Um, like I, I think that's, that's very dangerous. And mm-hmm. it, it, that's how I think the family starts to break up as mm-hmm. much as like, that sounds scary, but like, no, that's when the spouses aren't loving each other in the Completely. entirety of what right. that means. Um, there's, there's so much danger there. And I like what you said earlier about like giving our full desires to God in prayer and like letting him know our entire heart. And like I said earlier, earlier, like you, a lot of times are a good mirror for me to, to recognize like the parts that I'm falling short with God. So like, if I'm not willing to share something with you, I'm most likely not saying it fully to God or like, I'm kind of like, ah, he kind of knows. Mm. Right. But like putting actual words behind a desire, um, makes it more real and it's scary. Cause like, all right, now this is actually a real thing. Yeah. Or uh, on the flip side, if there's something that you've been bringing to prayer a lot to God, but like, haven't brought that to your spouse yet. Like that could also be a clue that he's desiring that for you, that he's desiring that accountability and that he's desiring that support for you mm-hmm. because like your spouse is, is a gift that God has given you. So maybe the answer to your prayer is your spouse and you've been keeping that from them. Right. And also like the, that the, that the spouse can be a minister of grace to the other spouse. Exactly. Like that's, that's so important. Right. Cause that was something that was, I was listening to father R- Ripperger about how um, like you and I can pray over each other with authority because um, like St. Thomas says, like I have a right to your body. You have a right to my body because th- through the marital covenant. Um, and so in the same way, like I can pray over you and there's, there's a, there's a particular sacramental grace that happens because of that. And a lot of couples don't tap into that because maybe they don't know about it, but also newborn giraffe, like it's, it's mm-hmm. super uncomfortable yeah. to do that. Like isn't prayer just at mass in the rosary by mercy chapel, like things that are wrote and like, you know, opening up, opening up our hearts is a lot harder to do. Yeah. But like if, if grace is God's life in our soul, going back to like that second grade definition like that God's life in our soul that is that is alive that is like moving that is real and um gosh the word is on the tip of my tongue but like it's it's not just static mm-hmm. and so like to activate grace to activate and to share and to like participate in that with one another because through the sacrament of marriage like we have been invited to to do that differently, I think is such a, is such a, is such an opportunity that we are missing out on because we're afraid or Mm -hmm. because we, you know, look like a newborn giraffe and like, don't know how to do this. And we're afraid to do that with in front of somebody else. Or, um, like what if we do it wrong? Like you, you can't really like do it wrong if you're trying, like if you're trying to pray with one another and for one another and, and asking God to like infuse his grace into these situations, you can't really do that wrong. Um, the way to do it wrong is to just not yeah, like to shy away from that. Um, 
So I think, yeah, these last few weeks have definitely challenged us to like to, to go there because yeah, we were doing a lot of, a lot of praying on our own, a lot of like spiritual battle on our own. And, um, and I think that like we can only be a stronger force Mm -hmm. against whatever we're facing, whatever evil we're facing. Um, we can only be stronger if we're doing it together. Yeah. And like you said, it's got grace is God's life in us. So like we are with God's life in us, we are tasked to, to move and act in union with Christ, which means that like that that's the entirety of his life from his miracles to his death on the cross. Like we are called to be united in all of that and in him and all of that. And I just think that's something I want to start doing more intentionally in our marriage and in our family and just everything we do. Amen. Thank you for being, <laughs> thank you for being here with us with this episode. I know we kind of, we just kind of started talking and uh, we went with it. We had a plan we had we a had, plan, and that is not what just happened in the last 45 minutes, what, but that's okay. So you get, when you ask me what I was reading, <laughs> all was mine. Fair, you, <laughs> I started you it. You opened with it, and I felt like I needed but to if reciprocate. You, <laughs> but if you, if you like the episode, please go ahead and leave us a a uh, smash that five-star rebu- review button and leave us a review, a comment review, and then uh, go ahead and on Spotify and do the same thing. Um, the more reviews we get, the more we get pushed out to the algorithm or the algorithm pushes out to more people. Um, shout out to our listeners in Northern Ireland. Thank you for yes. uh, listening to us. And then super shout out to all our patrons um, who make this podcast possible. Obviously, all of you listeners um, have a big impact and a reason why we're able to do this. Um, but our patrons in particular, thank you for supporting us. Um, we recently just had to buy new microphones because one of us is, ours was not working well and um just little things like that um you know not coming out of our own pocket and being supported by you just makes makes a huge difference um so that we're able to keep bringing you shows every week um so if you want to support us on patreon please visit patreon.com slash to become family um and if you aren't able to do that um please definitely leave us a review and we'll see you at the next episode